We were told at the height of the Me Too movement to believe all women, and now we're being told to believe children when they tell us who they are. But should we really? It's really clear that what we believe is not as important as if it is true. And so today on the show, we'll look at belief as we look at the belief system of Brandon Roberts and his LGBTQ affirming position. He might have been struck with lightning as a result of God's judgment. We'll take a look at that. And then we'll also take a look at Russell Moore and Rick Warren, have a conversation about the belief of women in ministry, some interesting things there. And then we'll look at Josh Howley, who takes Merrick Garland to task about attacking the belief of Catholics who just happen to be pro-life and using the federal government to to attack that belief. We'll talk about that and more today on Indie Thinker. Today's show is sponsored by our friends over at Anchor. Anchor is your one-stop shop for all of your small business solutions. They can help you with payroll. They can help you with accounting. They can help you with staffing. They can even help take your business to the next level with business strategies. But in order to do that and see all that they can help you with, you need to go to anchor.biz. That's A-N-C-U-R dot B-I-Z. Now, also, they're running an incredible special. They're offering free learning on QuickBooks so that if you want to start a career in accounting, you can do that with no cost to yourself. They'll give you the training and they'll also pay you to take that training. If you're interested in starting off your career and doing so with a great company, Anchor can help you. To see all the ways that they can help you not only find employment, but also take your business to the next level, go to ancur.biz. And when you do so, let them know that Andy Thinker sent you. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Just recently in Minnesota, we heard from the lieutenant governor who believes that we should believe children when they tell us who they are. Now, this is a response to some of the other states around our nation who have quickly picked up on the lightning bolt eureka moment that children actually shouldn't be in the position of making a decision as to whether or not they should chop off their healthy sex organs or if they should go through a gender-affirming surgery knowing that they may never ever have kids again. For those who believe that consent is the ultimate litmus test for a free society and not morality, let me remind you that small children do not have the ability to consent to basically anything other than pulling out the hair of their brother or little sister because kids don't actually have the intellectual capacity to consent to things. But it doesn't stop people like this lieutenant governor from suggesting that we should go from the Me Too movement of believing all women to the ludicrous belief of believing all children. So here's that. Because let's be clear, this is life affirming and life saving healthcare. When our children tell us who they are, it is our job as grown ups to listen and to believe them. That's what it means to be a good parent. So that's right. We should believe a child when they tell us who they are. So when your child says, hi, I am Paddington Bear or a unicorn, or if you're raising your kids right, I am Batman. uh, When your kids tell you that, you should definitely believe them. Now, do you know why I don't believe all children? Because I actually don't believe all adults. See, I've been in pastoral ministry long enough to realize that adults of a certain age don't even know who they are. In fact, the vast majority of adults in their adult life go through their life and never really truly discover who they are, what they're supposed to do. They don't don't figure that out because it's actually a pretty large existential question that cannot be answered by children. So why would I believe a six-year-old, a little boy or girl, when they tell me that they are of the opposite biological sex. Well, obviously, we all know the answer to that. And everybody who has a operating prefrontal cortex knows that a child should not be believed on almost anything, Um, that they will say things and they will do things that are ultimately socially constructed more so than they will actually operate in a world outside of the fictitious. But this is the troubling thing with secular humanism. Now, I talked about this a lot on the show last week, but, it, but I want to bring it just up here briefly just to say this, that this, the, the problem with secularists is that they want to believe things 
and say that the things that they believe need only to be stripped of religious or theological importance. And that if that happens, then it is obviously good. Now, I'll be the first to admit that there are Christians out there in the world who have beliefs that are not rooted in any kind of rational, logical, you know, real world. But this is also true of the secular humanists. Just because they extricate God from their conversation doesn't mean that they have actually like logical, moral arguments. And this is a proof text for the problem of secular humanism. Just removing God from the situation keeps us with the illogical and ridiculous conclusion that we should believe children when they tell us who they are. See, at the end of the day, I'm arguing on the show that belief matters and believing in things that are true actually matters because if we don't, we will reap the repercussions of it as a society. Let me give you an illustration of this. A guy named George Lemaitre was the father of the Big Bang Theory. Now, George Lemaitre's theory didn't find public acceptance for a while, even though scientific evidence pointed to the fact that that his theory was accurate. In fact, it wasn't until the Hubble telescope started to give us evidence that the universe was expanding that we finally had to come to terms with what this man was saying. The reason his ideas were resisted originally was because George Lemaitre was not only a scientist, but a Catholic priest. And there were many in the scientific community, especially those in power, who did not want to grant a theological premise in anything that was scientific. And so they resisted and resisted because they couldn't come to bring themselves to the point that the universe or that the world was created at a certain point in time because that would lend credence to the belief that there was a creator God uh, in in operation in the world today. Now, Lord George Lemaitre was not trying to make a specifically religious argument when he developed the Big Bang Theory. He was simply trying to take people where the evidence led him, and it just so happened to lead him to the biblical belief that there was a certain point in time where the universe didn't exist, and then it did, almost as if somebody said, let there be, and then it was. But the reason I bring that up is just simply this. What you believe influences what you do. The secularist who didn't want George Lemaitre's ideas to to proliferate, even though they were most likely true, and that it was a logical and plausible theory, were letting their false beliefs weigh against their better judgment. So what you believe matters not only because what you practice will be predicated upon your belief, or at least should be, but also because there are repercussions for those who believe the wrong things. When we look at this Minnesota lieutenant governor who tells us to believe children, and in the wake of that will be children who are castrated and have double mastectomies, you better believe that there are repercussions to what we believe. And it's why we need to have more conversations about it. And that's what we're gonna do today as we look at our top stories. So I've spoken to you in the past about Brandon Robertson, a cosplaying pastor who is LGBTQ affirming and practicing. Well, just recently, uh, he was caught on camera giving his kind of not only affirmation, but celebration of the LGBTQ community. And we are told in this beautiful, biblically based, not really sermon, that we can learn a lot from the queer and gay community, that in fact, they are the theolog- the theologians of society today that we need to listen to the most. In the midst of Brandon Robertson saying that, something interesting happened during his sermon. I'll let you see it here. Maybe minorities, sexual and gender minorities, have something to teach the church about dying to self, about new life, about... That was unnecessary. That is not a sign of God's judgment, okay? So I'll be the first to admit that video is a little eerie when lightning struck right in the middle of Brandon talking. I was thinking, whoa, dude, that's kind of interesting. And even Brandon mentions it at the end of his uh, of that clip where he says, hey, that wasn't God's judgment, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, so he seems to uh, be joking there, but maybe not joking. Uh, but, but I'll just step back and just say a lot of people online were talking about whether or not this is God's judgment. judgment. God sent that lightning strike to kind of put Brandon in check and to warn him before it's too late. So a couple of things that I'll say about kind of the this viral moment and how it went around uh, social media. I'll just say this, that I, I look at God in the Bible and he's a little bit more potent than 
and the kind of parlor chicks that we see in this clip. Uh, he has a way of getting people's attention far more, you know, uh, far more aggressively and even far more authoritatively than than kind of parlor tricks like we see here, making the lights go off and that that thunder strike. But yeah, to be to be fair, I also think Brandon would have to be dumb not to be thinking, oh wow, is that is there something to this? Um, but 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 let me just say, I, I think that perhaps this is that lightning strike is not the judgment of God because what Brandon is saying there is clearly unbiblical and certainly egregious, but nowhere near as bad as things he said in the past. For for instance, Brandon Roberts has gone on record to say that Christian orthodoxy is nothing more than a tool of white patriarchy to try to shove beliefs down people's throats. They immediately start figuring out ways to utilize their privilege, their power, their authority for their own benefit, and we see that in early Christianity. We see that throughout the ages with Christianity. And so I'm skeptical of orthodoxy. I'm we hear this a lot by the queer affirming theologian of today, that whether or not a theology is correct or not doesn't have anything to do with the Bible, but it has to do with those who are disenfranchised and those who get power from this belief, rather than whether or not it is actually true. These guys don't care about that. Uh, Brandon Roberts has also gone on the record more than just saying that orthodoxy is a tool of white oppressive patriarchy, but he's also gone on record as saying, well, Jesus was a racist. I mean, we all know this, right? Jesus was just a horrible racist. That there's a part of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus uses a racial slur. In Mark chapter 7, there's the account of the Seraphonician woman, a woman who is Syrian and Greek, both of which there were strong biases against within the Jewish community. And she comes to ask Jesus to heal her daughter who's possessed by a demon. And what is Jesus' response? He says, It's not good for me to give the children's food, meaning the children of Israel's food, to dogs. He calls her a dog. What's amazing about this account is that the woman doesn't back down. She speaks truth to power. She confronts Jesus and says, well, you can think that about me, but even dogs deserve the crumbs from the table. Her boldness and bravery to speak truth to power actually changes Jesus' mind. Jesus repents of his racism and extends healing to this woman's daughter. I love this story because it's a reminder that Jesus is human. He had prejudices and bias, and when confronted with it, he was willing to do his work. And this woman was willing to stand up and speak truth. It's just Brandon Roberts' way of saying, hey, we need to evolve in our understanding of the Bible instead of using it as an authoritative document, because, of course, Jesus himself was willing to evolve. So get with the times, you sorry, hypocritical, conservative evangelicals. So he said way worse than what he said on that stage there. So if God was going to strike him with lightning, I would think that, like, lightning would have struck that phone before he send it, sent out some of the ridiculous tweets that this guy sends out. Furthermore, I'll, I'll just say this. The reason I don't think this is God's judgment is because God's judgment is actually not just for Brandon, but it might actually be more broadly for each and every one of us who have tolerated for far too long pastors who are not willing to stand up for the truth. So in fact, the existence of Brandon Robertson actually is a form of God's judgment. It's his judgment upon the church and upon Christians that a man like this could go around calling himself a Christian and do so in good conscience. The only way that this happens, by and large, is simply because Christians have abdicated their duty of actually really, truly defining and, and, and making it clear what Christianity is in the present. And for far too long, instead of actually fighting the historical battle of the church for orthodox Christian belief, we've been fighting, you know, who has the bigger building and whose seats can put the most butts in them. We've been more interested in followers on social media and who looks the most flashy and who can get on preachers with sneakers the quickest, more so than we have actually been with developing a firm understanding of what Christianity actually looks like. So the rise and the success of Brandon Robertson, you might just say, is part of culture. But I actually think it's really because we haven't been doing what we need to do as the church to promote authentic and biblical Christianity. Because it's way more powerful and way more compelling than anything Brandon Robertson has ever said in his life. But the reason he's so popular is that at least he's trying to provide thoughtful answers to things that are important to him. They happen to be all the wrong answers, by the way, but at least he's trying. By and large, the vast majority of pastors avoid existential questions either because they are unwilling or incapable of answering them. And then in the meantime, we find a group of people who find that the church has nothing to offer them because it's not doing what it should be and has done all along, which is answer some of the biggest soul's uh, questions that we have in the present. And we need pastors who are willing to stand up in front of congregations all over the world and declare not only the authentic Christian belief, but also 
make sure we identify when that authentic belief isn't taking place. And certainly Brandon Robertson isn't willing to do that, but many mainstream pastors aren't either. And as a result, we see God's judgment in the present because we see that there are many people who are falling for this kind of nonsense and many people who are not willing to stand against it. And let me give you kind of a, for instance, I would say. Now, I, w- I want to be really, really fair here because I actually like Rick Warren. Uh, Rick Warren, in a roundabout way, is responsible for the salvation of my wife because she got saved while reading Purpose Driven Life, and I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, it was undeniable that it made a spiritual impact on the most amazing woman I've ever met in my life. So I'm really, really thankful for Rick Warren. But the ways in which sometimes we find in the present that people are squirming and and, and sidestepping the uncomfortable truths of scripture, uh, it's just happening more and more as we, as we, as we see in this clip where Rick Warren is talking to Russell Moore. Now, before I show it, I just got to say anytime a prominent Christian is speaking to Russell Moore, uh, if Russell Moore is not being argumentative, then there's probably a problem with the conversation because um, Russell Moore is like the number one producer of of secular Christian content, if that, if that's if that's a thing. Now I can justify the existence of that, but it's simply a humanistic lens of Christian, of Christianity in the present. This is what Russell Moore is pumping out over at Christianity Today, in the present, and this is no exception when he's talking to Rick Warren about the role of women in the Bible. So here is their conversation about the prominence of women and uh, what we should do about it, and how Rick Warren has kind of changed his position as he used to hold a Southern Baptist position about women in ministry and now has kind of, uh, he's kind of transformed that idea. So here's them talking. I understand why people get upset about this because I believed the way they did until three years ago. Mm. And I actually had to change because of scripture. Culture could not change me on this issue. Antidotes could not change me on this issue. Pressure from other people would not change me on this issue. What changed me was when I came to confrontation with four scriptures nobody ever talked about that I felt had strong implications about women in ministry. So real quick, before we go on and see some of the more kind of substantive answers he gives to this question, I'm going to just be really clear kind of what I think about this issue, that I think women have a prominent role in ministry, but that I do not believe that women should be responsible for leading churches. Um, I do not believe that women can be co-pastors, but can certainly teach. I don't believe that by teaching they're usurping authority over a man, um, but I but I definitely would hold to uh, complementarian views and not egalitarian views. And I think what we see here is Rick Warren becoming more kind of um, egalitarian in his belief rather than complementarian. Um, and he is doing so under the premise here, we've heard from him, that scripture, not culture, is demanding this change. That scripture demands that we change our belief about women leading churches and women pastors. Uh, scripture demands that rather uh, than, than, than culture. Now, I, I appreciate that because if that's true, then that's exactly the way we need to go about these things is we don't change based upon the culture and based upon the times. We hold to the timeless truths of God's word. And, and here Rick Warren is saying he's doing that. However, I, I want to push back gently and just say I don't believe that it's fair to say that the Bible is crafting this belief, but rather that hermeneutics is crafting this belief, that the way Rick Warren interprets scripture is actually what is changing him rather than than the Bible itself. So um, hopefully that's fair to say. Um, and I'll show you that kind of hermeneutic on display. Uh, so here's him talking about how uh, in, in the scripture that women had a role in the Great Commission. So here's him saying that. Now, Great Commission, go make disciples, baptize, teach. You can't say, well, the first two are for men and women, the last two are only for men, or maybe just ordained men. That's eisegesis. That's how you, you, you got a problem. Who authorized women to teach? Jesus. All authority is given to me. Therefore, teach. So real quick, let me just suggest that there's not a single on the person that believes that the Great Commission is just for men. Like, not really. Not really a, not, not a person who's taking the Bible seriously. The complementarian and the egalitarian together also believe that Matthew 28, the Great Commission, is for all people. It's for women and for men. The way in which that plays out, however, is the question, which which makes me realize that the reason he's suggesting here the straw man that uh, the Great Commission isn't just for men, uh, the reason that that's a straw man is because, one, he knows that there is no evangelicals that think that that's true. 
but also because he understands that when you read the Bible, the way in which that plays out is clearly in some ways gender specific or biological sex specific. So we don't use leftist words here. Okay. So what I mean by that is what women do and what men do is clearly different throughout scripture, but there is nobody who argues that women aren't sent. Yes, women are sent, but what they do when they are sent, obviously that's the question at the end of the day that he doesn't really seem to be willing to answer, or if he does, he tries to do so in this next segment. So here's that. On that day in, at Pentecost, we know women were in the upper room. We know women were filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We know that women were preaching in languages that other people couldn't hear to a mixed audience. We know women. It wasn't just men. Women were preaching on the day of Pentecost. How do we know that? Because Peter felt obligated to explain it. He explains why you're now seeing women preaching on the very first day of the church. He explains it. And he says, this is that that Joel predicted. Women were present at the day of Pentecost. That's totally indisputable. But do we see when when somebody gets up to speak that day to address the whole crowd and take control and lead that crowd, do we see a woman doing that or do we see a man doing that? In fact, do we ever, we see women speaking and we see women teaching, but do we ever see women leading the church throughout scripture? And, and the answer is no. And if that's true, then what we have to question is whether or not we are truly using biblical imperatives to help us understand the way we're interpreting Scripture. So it's interesting to me that you can't really argue too heavily that women are the ones who are leading the church and, and preaching at the church using that, that proof text, using the day of Pentecost, uh, because the person who gets up to speak that day and address the crowd authoritatively is, is a man. Um, but but it, th this is most prevalent in this idea that I've heard so much from Christians. Well, the, the first person who actually got the gospel and then started preaching it to the world was, was a woman who, because it was a woman who first saw the tomb was empty and then went to tell the apostles. And so the first gospel preacher was a woman and we need more gospel preachers who are women. By the way, a point I agree with, uh, but the way in which this is framed is, I think, a little bit dishonest and, and certainly not true to the text. So here's him talking about women and the first gospel preachers. The very first Christian sermon, the message of the gospel of good news of the resurrection, Jesus chose a woman to deliver it to men. He had Mary Magdalene go and tell the disciples. Now that clearly wasn't an accident. It was an intentional. It's a whole new world, baby. Now he has a woman go tell the apostles. You got on, can a woman teach an apostle? Evidently did it on the first day. He chose her to be the first preacher of the gospel. So the idea here is the first person to experience the resurrection and then to preach the resurrection is a woman. The only issue here is that, first of all, no one is saying that women just need to totally shut up. Women can talk. And this woman is just talking here. She's just giving people kind of current events. This is what just took place. Just wanted to let you guys know, thought you should know. But she's not like actually taking a role of leadership in the church. And she's not really even the first gospel preacher. All of that is to straw man this argument. So all this woman's doing is just simply telling leaders something that took place. And then these leaders go and confirm it for themselves. But in no way is there any present evangelical scholar who believes that women should just totally remain silent and never talk, or that in some way, in some way that it's bad for them to talk about current events and what's, what's taking place, that they can't tell their husband something their husband didn't know. That's not the argument here. The argument has always been, at least as far as I can tell, the role that women should take and the role that men should take, and that they are specific based upon the difference between a man and a woman. They are made of different substance. By the way, this is why this is so important that we affirm the difference between men and women and the different roles that they take. One, because I'm not so sure that Rick Warren is avoiding cultural imperatives as much as he thinks he is. There is this cultural malaise today that's overtaken the church by and large. Um, I, I would say pretty 
pretty much across the board, and that is that to be loving and to thought of ex- as someone who's accepting and tolerant, that is more important than somebody who preaches the truth. This is a cultural idea that has absolutely inundated the church, and I can't help but wonder if this isn't what Rick Warren is really trying to do. I want to show you that I'm developing with the times and that I'm very modern in my approach and that I believe women could do X, Y, and Z because, because that's how accepting and loving I am. Well, okay, it's hard for me not to see that that that's exactly what he's doing. And then the real problem here is that when we do that, not only are we straw manning what other people think, but we're also creating casualties that we need to be honest about. You say, well, Reed, well, don't exaggerate. Hopefully throughout this show, I have shown you that there are casualties for not being very careful uh, to understand what we believe and the repercussions of that belief. And I want to make that really, really clear in my final story here where uh, Representative Josh Hawley speaks And I want to make that really, really clear in my last argument here today as I show you Josh Hawley, who is taking Merrick Garland to task over the arrest apprehension of Greg Houck, who is a Catholic who was in front of a abortion clinic and who was protesting with his son. His son was pushed and Greg Houck pushed the man back. And then shortly thereafter, federal agents raided the home of Greg Houck with guns in hand to make sure that they arrested this truly criminal man. So here's Hawley taking Merrick Garland to task over this obscene event. All I know is what uh, the FBI has said, which is that they made the decisions on the ground as to what was safest and easiest. So you do not agree with your description of what happened on the scene. You don't agree with my description. I'm pointing out what the photo is. There are agents here who have long guns and ballistic shields. Let's take a look at the hardened criminals that your Justice Department sent these armed agents to go terrorize on that morning. Here they are. Here they are at mass. Here's the seven children with Mr. Houck and his wife. In this early morning, they were all at home. Mrs. Houck has said repeatedly, the children were screaming. They feared for their lives. You've got these agents demanding that he come out. They've got the guns, she said, pointing at the house and at them. He has offered to turn himself in. And this is who you go to terrorize. What's really interesting to me is this seems to directly contradict your own memorandum about the use of force at the Justice Department. You say officers may use only the force that is objectively reasonable to effectively control an incident. Are you telling me that in your opinion as Attorney General, it was objectively necessary to use 20 or 30 SWAT-style agents with long guns and ballistic shields For these people? What I'm saying is that decisions about how to go about this were made on the ground by FBI agents. So you're saying you don't know? I'm I'm saying what I just said. Which is that you're abdicating responsibility? I'm not abdicating responsibility. Then give me the answer. Is do you think in your opinion, you are the Attorney General of the United States, you are in charge of the Justice Department, and yes, sir, you are responsible. The so F- give me an answer. The FBI does not agree with your description. I'm not asking about the FBI. You are the Attorney General. Give me your answer. Do you think that it was objectively reasonable and they followed your guidelines in sending 20 to 30 armed agents to terrorize these people? Yes or no? The facts I have, which are those presented by the FBI, are not consistent with your description. District Attorney declines to prosecute. The private suit's dismissed. You use an unbelievable show of force with guns that I just note liberals usually decry. We're supposed to hate long long guns and assault-style weapons. You're happy to deploy them against Catholics and innocent children. Happy to. Now, I love the double standard on display here. So this is Merrick Garland who says that parents protesting at school board meetings are domestic terrorists, and white supremacy is the greatest threat in America right now, not Joe Biden and gibberish. But but I love this guy who is on the gun control left, as Howley points out, sending in armed federal agents to go tackle and apprehend a, uh, a, a civilian, uh, a, an unarmed man in his home with a bunch of kids around crying. So... Um, by the way, I mentioned that this happened because a activist shoved Hauk's kid. That, that's that's not quite what happened. The activist got in the face of a small child and accosted that child and threatened that child, and then Greg Hauk pushed the man back. So I think it's interesting. Greg Hauk pushes a man who's in his child's face, but no f- armed federal agents got on to this protester who was accosting a small child. So here, again, we have another double standard. 
listen, and, and here's the real problem, is that when you don't affirm what you believe in and you don't truly investigate what you believe in, you're left with nothing more than arbitrary standards. You have a double standard when you don't have a firm belief rooted in something permanent and something authoritative. So it's this idea that if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And the real problem with that is that you'll often take people with you. See, it's not a victimless crime, your belief system. So it's important that we investigate it and we know what we believe and why we believe it. And most importantly, that we have an authoritative source from which we derive our beliefs. Because everybody is worshiping something. The question is, is are you worshiping the right thing? Are you worshiping the truth? Because in the meantime, when we don't investigate our beliefs, not only do we have double standards, but there are kids in Minnesota and beyond, as I talked about at the beginning of the show, that are suffering the consequences of people who want to believe all children and believe all women and believe everything except believe the things that will actually make the biggest difference in my life and in yours. And until we get back to that, we'll reap the consequences for it. So we better be honest about it. If you want to be honest about it, I would love to hear from you down in the comments section below. If you watch this long and you don't want to be honest, I at least appreciate you for doing so. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And most importantly, go with God.